time. Now, what if we had not had, and we had a crate, we had a, I don't think I need to persuade you that we had a housing bubble, that house prices were super high, and it, it, it was a vicious cycle. Because the higher house prices got, the less people could afford to buy them. So the more financing they needed to get, and the more financing that was made available to them, what would happen? Well, what would happen is, of course, we would push the price of houses up, as indeed happened. But what would, else, what would also rise would be interest rates, because the banks would begin to run out of loanable funds. So they would have to, so interest rates, there'd be upward pressure put on interest rates, and that would put an end to speculation in real estate. We'd have to just stop in our tracks. That's what Hayek meant when he said that the interest rate operates as a break. It operates as a break on our ambition, so that we don't try to do more than, more than we can. But when you're the central planning agency for money, you can just keep pumping money into the system, keep pushing those interest rates back down, giving the banks more and more to lend, and just keep the phony process going. Uh, moreover, um, we also hear about lending standards declining. And we get a lot of talk about the Community Reinvestment Act and, and things like that. And, and to a degree, that's all well and good. And there were um, aspects of this, like Fannie and Freddie I haven't even gotten into, that did encourage more house buying than would have occurred otherwise. But it's important to remember the role of the Federal Reserve in all this. Because let's suppose, suppose you have a basketball team, and you pick all the players for your team, and then five minutes later you get told, oh, by the way, there's a new rule. You can pick two more players. Where are you going to get those two more players from? from the pool of rejects who are, who are walking home, who, who didn't get picked the first time. So naturally, if you have the chance to pick more players, your standards have to fall, because you already picked the best players. Well, likewise for banks. If suddenly they get these big infusions of cash from the Federal Reserve, uh, what's going to happen? They've already lent out the money to all the credit-worthy borrowers at that interest rate. So what are they going to have to do? They're going to have to lower their standards in order to uh, to, to reach, because they always want to be lent out to the degree possible, and every incentive in our economy encourages them to do that. So it's precisely this that, that makes them less concerned about uh, standards. They've got all this money that's burning a hole in their pocket. And then to add insult to injury, we have the phenomenon that is referred to as the Greenspan put, which, of course, Greenspan never said this in so many words, but you just observe his behavior. It was the conviction on Wall Street that if anything really goes bad, well, don't worry, Greenspan and the Fed will, will do something to bail us out of it. You know, he'll, he'll give us super, super cheap loans, you know, super cheap interest rates, or he'll, he'll, he'll do some kind of bailout and we'll, we'll see our way through. And so, for example, in 1998, we had a hedge fund called Long-Term Capital Management. There, there's an Orwellian name for you. Long-Term Capital Management goes completely bust and what does, uh, what does Greenspan do? Well, he arranges for a bailout of long-term capital management. And so what message does this send, of course? Well, it sends the message that if some crummy hedge fund is going to be bailed out, well, we investment banks have nothing to worry about. He's not going to let us go under. And so let's just full steam ahead. No need to change our strategies. No need to look at, look at anything and consider maybe we're, we're, um, we're, we're leveraged too much. Ah, ah, forget about it. We got our buddy over here. And we see this repeated time and again by uh, the heads of these firms. They say, hey, yeah, we got our friend here. He, he's fine. He's going to help us. You know, in the weeks after Bear Stearns collapsed, it's very interesting what happened with Lehman Brothers. Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns have basically the same kinds of assets. So if Bear Stearns is in big trouble, then, you know, any investor would think, well, Lehman must be in big trouble too. And yet in the weeks following the Bear Stearns collapse, Lehman is still able to raise hundreds of millions of dollars even from traditionally conservative investors, including a uh, money market fund. How, how, how? I mean, that's not normal. Like, why, why? is everyone insane? And, and of course, the answer is that everybody figured, well, you know, Lehman will be bailed out. So don't, don't even, th just don't even worry about, don't even assess the risks. Just go ahead and do it. Because some sugar daddy will come along and put everything right. Now, as it turns out, Lehman was not bailed out. But the point is that destructive decisions are made on, on the basis of these sorts of expectations. So this is the elephant in the living room amid all the talk of the, supposedly, of the free market. The very existence of a Federal Reserve institutionalizes the phenomenon of moral hazard. Moral hazard is this phenomenon by which people act with an artificially elevated level of risk tolerance because they expect that they will be able to keep all the profits, but that the losses will be eaten by the suckers in, in society. Well, when you have an institution on which there is no physical constraint when it comes to creating money. It's not like they have to mine the money out of the ground. They just type it on a computer and the money comes into existence. Everybody knows that that institution is there. So that itself 
multiplies moral hazard. Everybody knows that the potential for bailout is very great because for a bailout, all you need to do is just get enough political clout and you can get your bailout, and that is what typically happens. Now, I don't want to keep you all night, so I, I will say a few more things and then, uh, then take some questions. But uh, one, thing, one objection people may have is, didn't we have booms and busts before we had a Federal Reserve? I mean, wasn't the Federal Reserve created in 1913? Aren't you trying to explain too much with the Federal Reserve? I mean, weren't there downturns in the 19th century? You can't blame those on Alan Greenspan. Well, I might. No, actually, no. But it turns out, though, if you look more closely, if you look at the 19th century and you look at these, uh, these downturns, what do you, in fact, see? The same phenomena in every case, the, the, the same phenomena of, of uh, artificial credit creation uh, leading to an artificial boom, uh, leading to a bust, and, and contemporaries at the time pointing this out. The definitive book on the Panic of 1819 was written by Murray Rothbard, Columbia University Press, 1962. All the major historical and economic journals says this, say this is the definitive work on this subject. And he shows that after the Panic of 1890, people were saying, all right, the banking system is all screwed up. It's getting our economy on these unsustainable sugar highs, and then we come crashing back down again. The, the money supply is super volatile. No, we've got to stop this. We've got to rein this in. Thomas Jefferson began developing a plan to just get the country off paper money entirely. This what people just concluded. This is clearly what's causing this. Same thing for the Panic of 1837. They said, oh, it's crazy inflationary banks causing these problems, giving us these artificial booms, crazy speculative fevers in real estate. I mean, it sounds like something from 2008. And yet it's, it's, it's 1837. And you keep looking through the century. And then we're told, well, in the 1870s, we had the Long Depression. You don't want that, right? If we, had, we didn't have the Fed, we'd, we, we'd have another Long Depression. Okay, well, number one, we had a longer depression after 1929. That's when we did have the Fed. But apparently, we're not supposed to criticize the Fed for 1929 because that was just practice. <laughs> but in the 1870s, it turns out that economic historians are now saying, and Rothbard had this nailed 30 years ago, but economic historians are now saying, wait a minute, you know what? We actually looked at it more closely. That, sorry, we were, we were wrong. There actually wasn't a long depression of the 1870s. Don't throw anything at us. but. Turns out there wasn't one. Uh, we thought there was, but we were looking at the data wrong, and it turns out there was a mild recession in 1873, but otherwise, perfectly okay decade. 1880s were very robust. Um, if you look at the, the uh, bank panics that we have in the US after the Civil War and before the Fed, we got a bunch of them, that's true. In the 1870s, you see uh, 1873, 1884, and the 1890s, and 1907. We do have bank panics, and people have tried to claim, well, just goes to show that free market, it's always screwing you. But in fact, if you look more closely, you will ask the question, how come bank panics were so infrequent in the rest of the world at that time? And completely non-existent in Canada. I mean, is Canada so different from the US? Like, why would there have been? I mean, what is there that differentiated the U.S. from Canada? And to make a long story short, it was government regulations in the U.S. At the state level, many states had so-called unit banking laws that made it a crime to have, like, you could not actually have more than one office for your bank. So you couldn't have a branch bank. You couldn't branch bank across the state, certainly not across the country. That's completely out of the question. So every bank has one office. Well, this is predictable enough. If, if, if you're confined to one office, then your fortunes are going to be very tied up with those people, you know, in a two-mile radius who are borrowing from you. And if something goes wrong there, then your whole bank is brought down. And so it turns out that the U.S. has these unit banking laws, and it suffers this major problem, continual problem with banks that are undiversified and fragile. Canada does not have these unit banking laws. So at the time of the Great Depression, the U.S. has about 9,000 bank failures. In Canada, there were zero, zero bank failures. And so it turns out that actually regulation was actually, and I know this sounds, sounds impossible to believe because we all know that regulation, the definition of regulation is when smart people think up infallible rules that will protect us from disaster and nothing can ever go wrong or there's nothing that they ever overlook, that it does seem hard to calculate that regulation could have caused this, but that does seem to be the case. Uh, and then finally, I will just say quickly on the subject of regulation, because I, I, yeah, yeah, I'm just, just, sorry, I'm gonna keep you a few more minutes, sorry about this. I just yammer on. If I'd had that wine, you know, we would have solved this whole thing. Uh, 
But we hear a lot about, well, didn't deregulation cause this crisis? So again, there's this attempt to try to, try to say that, well, this crisis is different from all other crises. It must just be some weird thing about this. And, and, the, and the crisis of the dot-com thing, that was a weird thing in and of itself. And then in the early 80s, that recession, that had its own set of explanations. But it's important to look at what the common denominator is. And it's always this artificial credit creation leading to an artificial boom that ends in a bust. It's just, it's just there every single time. And we're just consistently led not to look at it. And instead to try to argue about the particular contours of one particular crisis. Now, it is important to look at those contours uh, for the sake of historical knowledge. But, uh, but in this particular case, you know, people are trying to say deregulation caused it. Well, I don't see. Now, I, I am not infallible. I could be wrong on this. But I don't see which repealed regulation would have prevented this crisis. Because um, what we had was banks holding large holdings of so-called mortgage-backed securities, assets that are backed by people's mortgage payments. Now, banks were always allowed to hold things like this. Like, there wasn't some deregulation that allowed them to. They were always allowed to buy things like this if they thought they were a good investment and hold them as long as they want. And then if they just want cash or they think it's no longer a good investment, they can sell them. That's always been allowed. The process of so-called securitization has always been allowed. That, that was not some deregulation that occurred. Um, the, um, so in other words, everything that was done could have been done, even in the absence of so-called deregulation. We do hear a little bit of this so-called repeal of Glass-Steagall. I don't want to get into this because it's super technical, but if you do want to ask me about it in the question period, I will gladly go into more detail about that. But I think that's a complete red herring. Because nothing that happened in this crisis really seems to have anything to do with the Glass-Steagall provision that was, in fact, repealed. The relevant ones are still in effect. So as I say, if you want to ask me about that, I will, but I will answer that. But I, I don't want to uh, keep uh, much longer. But finally, and I know I've said finally several times, but this is the final, finally. This is it. This is absolutely it. There ain't no more finallys. Um, I, will, I will turn it off if there's one more finally. Uh, and that is, we're being told that right now what we need now, what the economy needs now, we all know what it needs now. Stimulus, of course, right? We need, we, need, we need to gin this thing up a little bit more, right? I mean, you know, it's, it's like, just imagine like a, a bicycle with like, you know, like a, a one and a half wheels that's held together by scotch tape. We need a little more tape and, you know, like a little clown sticker and then, then it will be all right. <laughs> <laughs>